The same reason necessitates evil and sorrow in humanity, which renders indispensable the bitterness of the water of the seas. Here also harmony can result only from the analogy of contraries, and what is above exists by reason of what is below. It is the depth that determines the height, and if the valleys are filled up, the mountains disappear. So if the shadows are effaced, the light is annulled, which is only visible by the graduated contrast of gloom and splendor, and universal obscurity will be produced by an immense dazzling. Even the colors in the light only exist by the presence of the shadow. It is the threefold alliance of the day and the night. The luminous image of the dogma, the light made shadow, as the Savior is the Logos made man. And all this reposes on the same law, the primary law of creation, the single and absolute law of nature, that of the distinction and harmonious ponderation of the contrary forces in the universal equipoise. The two great columns of the temple that symbolizes the universe are necessity of the omnipotent will of God, which nothing can disobey, and liberty or the free will of his creatures. Apparently, and to our human reason, antagonistic, the same reason is not incapable of comprehending how they can be in equipoise. Equipoise. The infinite power and wisdom could so plan the universe in the infinite succession of things as to leave man free to act and foreseeing what each would at every instant think and do. To make of the free will and free action of each an instrument to aid in effecting its general purpose. For even a man foreseeing that another will do a certain act and in no wise controlling or even influencing him may use that action as an instrument to effect his own purposes. The infinite wisdom of God foresees what each will do and uses it as an instrument by the exertion of his infinite power, which yet does not control the human action at, so as to annihilate his free, its freedom. The result is harmony, the third column that upholds the lodge. The same harmony results from the equipoise of necessity and liberty. The will of God is not for an instant defeated nor thwarted, and this is the divine victory. And yet he does not tempt nor constrain men to do evil, and thus his infinite glory is unimpaired. The result is stability, cohesion, and permanence in the universe, and undivided dominion and autocracy in the deity. And these victory, glory, stability, and dominion are the last four sephiroth of the Kabbalah. I am, God said to Moses, that which is, was, and shall forever be. But the very God in his manifested essence conceived of as not yet having created and as alone has no name. Such was the expressed doctrine of all the ancient sages and is so expressed declared in the Kabbalah. Is the name of the deity manifested in a single act, that of creation and containing within himself, in idea and actuality, the whole universe to be invested with form and be materially developed during the eternal succession of ages? As God never was not, so he never thought not, and the universe has no more had a beginning than the divine thought of which it is the utterance, no more than the deity himself. The duration of the universe is but a point halfway upon the infinite line of eternity and god was not behind that point the archetype of the universe did not did never not exist in the divine mind the word was in the beginning with god and was god and the ineffable name that is not of the very essence but of the absolute manifested as being or existence for existence of being said the philosophers is limitation and the very deity is not limited nor defined but is all that may be possible may possibly be besides all that is was and shall be Reversing the letters of the ineffable name and dividing it becomes bisexual, as the word yud he or jah is, and disclosing, discloses the meaning of much of the obscure language of the Kabbalah, and is the highest of which the columns Jackson and Boaz are the symbol. In the same of deity we are told, God created the man, male and female created he them, and the writer symbolized the divine by the human, then tells us that the woman at first contained in the man was taken from his side. So Miniverva Minerva, goddess of wisdom, was born, a woman in armor of the brain of Jove. Isis was the sister before she was the wife of Osiris, and within Brahm, the source of all, the very good, without sex or name, was developed Maya, the mother of all that is. The word is the first and the only begotten of the father, and the awe with which the highest mysteries were regarded has imposed silence in respect to the nature of the Holy Spirit. The word is light, and the life is humanity. It is for the adepts to understand the meaning of the symbols. Return now with us to the degrees of the blue masonry, and for your last session receive the explanation of one of their symbols. You see upon the altar of those degrees a square and compass, and you remember how they lay upon the altar in each degree. 
The square is an instrument adapted for plane surfaces only and therefore appropriate for ge geometry or measurement of the earth, which appears to be and was by the ancients supposed to be a plane. The compass is an instrument that has relation to spheres and spherical surfaces and is adapted to spherical trigonometry or that branch of mathematics which deals with the heavens and the orbits of the planetary bodies. The square, therefore, is a natural and appropriate symbol of the earth and the things that belong to it are of it or concerned. The compass is an equally natural and appropriate symbol of the heavens and of all celestial things and celestial natures. You see at the beginning of this reading an old hermetic symbol copied from the Materia Prima of Valentius, printed at Frankfurt in 1613 with a treatise entitled Esote. Upon it you see a triangle upon a square. Triangle. Anyway. Both of these contain in a circle, and above this standing upon a dragon, a human body, with two arms only, but two heads, one male and the other female. By the side of the male head is the sun, and by that of the female the moon, the crescent within the circle of the full moon. And the hand of the male side holds a compass, and, on, and that on the female side a square. The heavens and the earth were personified as deities, even among the Aryan ancestors of the European nations of the Hindu, Zens, Bactrians, and Persians, and the Rig Veda Sanhita contains hymns addressed to them as gods. They were deified also among the Phoenicians and among the Greeks, Oranos and Gia. Heaven and earth were sung as the most ancient of the deities by Hesiod. It is the great, fertile, beautiful Mother Earth that produces with limitless profusion of benefice, 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 <laughs> benefice, benefice, everything that ministers to the needs, to the comfort, and to the luxury of man. From her teeming and inexhaustible bosom comes the fruits and the grain, the flowers in their season. From it comes all that feeds the animals which serve man as laborers and for food. She in the fair springtime is green with abundant grass and the trees spring from her soil, and from her teeming vitality take their wealth of green leaves. In her womb are found the useful and valuable minerals. Hers are the seas, the swarm with life. Hers the rivers that furnish food and irrigation and the mountains that send down the streams which swill into these rivers. Hers the forests that feed the sacred fires for the sacrifices that blaze upon the domestic hearse. The earth, therefore, the great producer, was always represented as a female, as the mother, great, bounteous, beneficent Mother Earth. Sorry for slurring that word earlier. <clears throat> On the other hand, it is the light and heat of the sun in the heavens and the rains that seem to come from them that in the springtime make fruitful this bountiful producing earth that restores life and warmth to her veins, chilled by winter, set up running her free streams, and beget, as it were, the greenness and the, that abundance of which she is so prolific. As the procreative and generative agents, the heavens and the sun have always been regarded as male, as the generators that fructify the earth and cause it to produce. The hermaphroditic figure is a symbol of the double nature anciently assigned to the deity, its generator and producer, as Brahm and Maya among the Aryans, Osiris and Isis among the Egyptians, as the sun was male, so the moon was female, and Isis was both the sister and the wife of Osiris. The compass, therefore, is the hermetic symbol of the creative deity and the square of the productive earth or universe. From the heavens come the spiritual and immortal portion of man. From the earth is material and mortal portion. The Hebrew Genesis says that Yahweh formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Through the seven planetary spheres represented by the mystic ladder of the Mithraic initiations. And it by that which Jacob saw in the dream. Not with three, but with seven steps. The souls emanating from the deity descended to be united to the human bodies and through those seven spheres they must reascend to return to their origin and home in the bosom of the deity the compass therefore as a symbol of the heavens represents the spiritual intellectual and moral position of the double nature of humanity and the square as a symbol of the earth its material sensual and baser portion truth and intelligence said one of the ancient Indian sects of philosophers are the eternal attributes of God not of the individual soul which is susceptible both of knowledge and ignorance of pleasure and pain therefore god and the individual soul are distinct and this expression of the ancient nayaya 